Welcome. In the last couple of lectures, we've been looking at the history of colonialism in Africa, at the colonies established by Europe around the turn of the 20th century. Now, it is hardly surprising that Africans began to protest, to oppose European rule in various fashion. This requires little explanation, it seems to me, what does require description and explanation are the tactics, the strategies, the dynamics, the phases, the timing of the successes and failures of movements organized in protest or opposition to the colonial realities. In a sense, there were two kinds of protest against colonial rule. The first we might describe as the kind which looked back which looked back and sought to re-establish the independence which Africans had previously enjoyed. The second kind was the kind which looked forward to a new Africa, an Africa different from both the pre-colonial and the colonial models. Now, it's a useful analytical distinction, but I must caution that the interface between these two types of of anti-colonial protest is complex, was complex. They overlapped and coexisted for, for many people. Nonetheless, in the first category of this backward-looking uh, anti-colonialism, we might place the numerous rebellions which broke out in the early colonial period, the first phase of the colonial period. That is the phase marked by its consolidation prior to World War I. We could put in that category, for instance, the first Shimmeringa in the territory of southern Rhodesia in 1896 and 1897, when peoples relatively recently brought into the colonial fold by Cecil Rhodes' British South Africa Company, uh, rose up in an 18-month-long rebellion, uh, a vain attempt, as it turned out, to, to cast off that uh, colonial imposition. There were other examples in the East African territory held by the Germans before World War I, uh, the so-called Maji Maji Rebellion. Now, this word comes from the Swahili word for, for water. The, the name for the rebellion comes from the Swahili word for water. And it certainly was a military revolt, but it was shot through with religious ideas and spiritual symbolism, the name actually comes from the belief, the hope, again vain as it turned out, that the bullets of the German colonial occupiers would turn to water uh, in the, the battles of that rebellion. Now the genealogy of what is usually called African nationalism, on the other hand, goes back to the second, the forward-looking mode which I, I just described. Nonetheless, to illustrate again that the links, the lines between these two are quite blurred, some have argued for more direct linkages between so-called primary resistance, that is the, the sort in my first category, and the later forward-looking movements. And the later nationalists undoubtedly invoked the imagery of pre-colonial greatness to mobilize their own supporters. And I think one can see this illustrated very directly in the renaming which took place as African colonies became independent of colonial rule. We get uh, the Gold Coast shifting its name to Ghana, named after, of course, a, a major kingdom we looked at in the, or the early phases of, of the Sudanic uh, belt. In the case of southern Rhodesia, of course, in 1980, taking the name of Zimbabwe, drawn from the Old Kingdom Empire and the largest ruins south of the Nile River in all of Africa, uh, represented by the, the old city of Great Zimbabwe. So again and again, we see that at least there is the evocation of the African past, even on the part of those who very firmly wish to move into the future. Now, the first generation of these forward-looking nationalists perhaps we should call them proto-nationalists, were then modernizers. And I'm talking about a generation which comes to, into its 
its age, its adulthood, uh, around the time of the First World War and really flowers uh, in the years following that. They were modernizers. They tended to accept quite a number of the premises of so-called Western civilization. Certainly a faith in education, a scientific worldview, and maybe most important of all, the notion of progress. After all, progress is perhaps the most fundamental idea of the whole modernization project anywhere. Now these men, and the most visible figures were, overwhelmingly, uh, male, were an elite by virtue of possessing an unusually high degree of Western-style education. So the first voices in protest of Western colonialism were in fact often the most westernized themselves. There were exceptions, but many of them were Christians. They wore Western suits. They were fond of their after afternoon tea. They were the clerks, the teachers, the clergymen, the journalists, the lawyers, of the colonial situation. Now, very few of these figures called at this point for an end of colonial rule per se. Rather, they exposed repeatedly and opposed what they saw as the hollow promises offered in the name of the civilizing mission, if you will. They saw shortcomings of two main types. The first was a shortcoming which applied to themselves, to people like themselves, for fellow members of the elite. They protested against the ceilings placed upon their upward mobility. Now we saw in the last lecture that these ceilings were lower in some empires than in others in general. Uh, lower in the British Empire and higher in the French, for instance. But even in the French Empire, where some Africans could live in Paris, be part of the, the café and salon society to some degree, there was a sense of hypocrisy concerning the imperial promise. Again, even in the French case where, where peoples were, uh, some of these persons were, were members of the French Parliament. I return to that that word hypocrisy concerning the imperial promise. Now the second kind of shortcoming which was articulated by this generation of proto-nationalists were shortcomings of the colonial enterprise which had a much wider application. These men, after all, were not blind to, and they were often genuinely and sincerely outraged by the abuses they saw occurring around them in the name of colonialism, the abuses of forced labor and taxation and corporal punishment, etc., visited on their fellow less privileged Africans. Their style at this stage was the letter, the, the petition, the delegation, the polite and respectful again, almost always well-dressed, but firm and reasoned uh, case being made that justice and fairness, virtues extolled by the colonizers, demanded better treatment for all and not least a recognized voice for themselves. In some respects, they wanted to, to call the bluff, if you want to put it that way, of those who came into Africa in the name of the civilizing mission. These men were often in contact with sympathizers, with allies abroad, and the forging of international links in the interwar period in particular is, is a very striking uh, development. They were in touch with socialists inside the, the metropoles themselves, in places like London, the Fabian Society, uh, with the, the Communist Party in, um, in, in Paris. They were certainly in touch with Pan-Africanists from the West Indies and from the United States. Not a great many were 
what we might consider true revolutionaries, but they certainly articulated regularly a vision of a better world. I mentioned Pan-Africanism, and in a sense, Pan-Africanism really reaches its heyday, which may be slightly surprising, uh, in the, the interwar period, the period of high colonialism, when perhaps the very commonality of the colonial experience uh, seemed to be shared and felt by, by so many. Now, the degrees of success uh, realized or enjoyed by this first generation of, of proto-nationalists varied widely. For every Blaise Johnny or, or Lamine Guy working out of their bases in, in Dakar and Saint Louis in, in Senegal and able to obtain legal status of citizen rather than subject, a, a legal distinction in the French Empire for thousands in French West Africa. For every success like that, there was a Harry Thuku in, in Kenya, jailed at the time of the First World War for his articulation of, of protests. Or a DDT Jabavu, the son of a, a famous um, African journalist and, and uh, educated African in South Africa. Uh, a real visionary, full of hope at the time of the First World War. Uh, by the time of the Second, a man who had retreated into uh, a very bitterly felt exile, internal exile though it was, in South Africa. For the nationalist movements to really take off, they needed, forgive my imagery here, my metaphor, but they needed to join a head that is the elite that we've been discussing, with a body, with mass participation by ordinary persons unhappy with the colonial situation. It was precisely that possibility of the joining of the elite with mass participation, the construction of mass opposition movements, which colonial authorities, understandably, feared the most. They feared, of course, uh, a fear which led them to endless complaints of so-called agitators trying to stir up the uh, otherwise content so-called natives. Now, this takeoff, if you like, this, this creation of the elite body uh, joined to the, excuse me, the elite head joined to the, the body of, of mass protest, this takeoff to successful, momentum-building nationalist movements is really the subject of our next lecture. But we can note here that the preconditions emerge. The storm gathers, most definitely in the decade centered around the Second World War. In the rural sphere, African peasant farmers, small-scale farmers, but involved in the cash crop nexus, the cash crop connection, increasingly chafed under colonial institutions like marketing boards. Marketing boards are worth mentioning. We'll come back to them in uh, our look at post-colonial Africa in a place like Ghana, where uh, ordinarily the marketing board, which was a monopsonistic institution, that is a sole buyer institution, it, it bought all the cocoa to be marketed, bought it at a particular producer price, but sold it on the world market, of course, at a, at a different price with a quite considerable margin. And the margin, of course, as it became uh, clear and realized to those producers was not something that they were, were terribly fond of. Uh, and they acted, in some cases, against the marketing board monopolies. The most dramatic example did indeed come in the Gold Coast. We call it Ghana now, and again, that's an example of the, the reaching back to the um, would-be glorious past, uh, in a, a so-called hold-up. It was a boycott. It was a holding of the cocoa off the market until the uh, producer price was, uh, was raised. And it came in 1938, uh, the year, of course, before the Second World War breaks out. Now, the real action, however, developed in the urban areas. 
in Africa's cities. After all, these were the places which tended to emerge precisely as part of that intensification of export production, which tended to be uh, built around the, the mining areas or nearby the places where uh, the cash crops would be produced or, or marketed. And this, as I say, is really where the energy emerging in this decade around the Second World War finds its focus. In the whole continent of Africa, the length and the breadth of it, the decade or so, some really closer to about a dozen years or so, involving a few years on either side of the Second World War, was a time of labor unrest never seen before in African history and never seen since. Uh, the list of major work stoppages that took place precisely at the time that, this was, that there was this enormous mobilization of resources for the war effort uh, was, was remarkable. In 1935, the copper belt of, of Zambia, again, producing the one great part of, or the one great product of that mono economy constructed by the British in northern Rhodesia. Major strike in 1935. And another one in 1940 as the war is actually underway. And again, copper, a critical material useful to the Allies, critical for the Allies uh, in many respects in the war effort. In Mombasa and Dar es Salaam, and again, these of course are the crucial port cities. These are the the gateways from the pathways leading from the points of production uh, into uh, the, the wider world. Mombasa and Dar es Salaam, major harbor strikes in 1939 and 1947. In the Gold Coast, we mentioned the rural action of the cocoa holdup, but the, coal, the Gold Coast sees strikes in its railways and in its mines in 1939 and again in 1948. And again, look at the, uh, the particular kinds of industries I'm getting at here. The railways, mines, the primary products, the critical central parts of the colonial economic uh, project. In both Rhodesias, uh, a major railway strike in, in 1945, which I myself have done a great deal of research on, and again, a kind of pan-Africanist movement in itself. There was a single railway line, the Rhodesia Railways, which served both of those territories, and the workers all over it, to a man, went out on strike literally 50 days after the ending of the Second World War. That's followed by a general strike in 1948 in southern Rhodesia, which starts in the, the cities among uh, a whole variety of industries, but spreads to virtually every sphere of the entire economy. In South Africa, in many respects a special case, but very much part of this trend, this explosive urban unrest trend of the, the decade of the 40s. In 1946, 70,000 uh, African miners come out on strike in, where else? The gold mines the commodity which, in a lot of respects, as we argued in previous lectures, uh, built uh, modern, modern South Africa. Um, and in some ways, most dramatic of all, and the entire French West African, the entire French West African railway system in 1947 and 1948 comes to a halt, uh, again, as a part of one of these uh, urban-based uh, work stoppages. Never a period like that before, and frankly, never a period like that uh, since. In a number of respects, and partly to keep the war effort going, uh, significant concessions were made. The railway strike people uh, struck, just as, uh, excuse me, struck just after the war ended in the Rhodesias, but the needs for a recovering uh, Britain at that point were such uh, in the immediate post-war era that significant concessions were won. Needless to say, uh, this inspired further action in and of itself. And finally, we have to, to bring into this picture the African soldiers themselves. After all, they had to the tune of something like a half million, 500,000 or so of them, had 
left their homes, in many cases gone overseas. They had fought. Uh, a good number of them had died for causes that they were told included anti-racism and self-determination. If one looks at something like the Atlantic Charter signed by uh, Roosevelt and Churchill in the, uh, the middle of the, the war years, uh, it is, of course, um, a very ennobling document. In some respects, it represents a sort of first draft of, of the United Nations Charter, which, which comes at the, at the war's end. But uh, it embodies these, these, again, promises is almost the only word that, that can be used here, of things like human dignity, of, of universal human rights, of self-determination, uh, and, and so on. The fight against Nazi Germany, of course, articulated and enunciated in many respects as, as a fight against the kind of narrowness of a, uh, an almost perverse form of, of racist ideology in the case of, of Nazi Germany. Uh, again, these were some of the, the motivators put out there to recruit and draft these soldiers. That is what they fought in the name of. And yet, of course, they returned to colonial situations, which to so many of them and so many people whom they communicated with uh, seem to contradict these very principles. If you look at a novel like... Uh, uh, and Gugi Wationgo's novel, Weep Not Child, which is really about uh, the, the Mau Mau rebellion of the 1950s in Kenya. But in the early phases of that novel, one of the, the several brothers who are part of the crucial family there is exactly what I've just described, a, a soldier who's returned from service overseas in the name of these noble principles during the Second World War and is coming back to a Kenya which, as I say, seems to contradict so many of those elements. So, from a whole variety of arenas, from a whole variety of directions, from the rural sphere, from the urban sphere, from the, the sphere of returning soldiers, we seem to see the elements gathering here. Again, this storm, if you're looking at it from the colonial perspective, these storm clouds are definitely uh, rolling in as the 1940s uh, move towards uh, the 1950s. Now, this is perhaps a, a good moment to step back and to theorize a bit, perhaps make a comparative point uh, concerning African nationalism. The, wor the, the word nationalism, the root of the word nationalism, of course, and obviously, is, is nation. That, in turn, begs the question of what a nation is, after all, and how nationalism is related to it. Now, if we consider these terms in their sort of classic European historical context, nation and nationalism, the nations were populations united by a perception of, let's call it fellowness, by a common identity based on a common language in, in most cases, common cultural traditions, and so on. To use one memorable phrase of a, a great student of European nationalism, these were communities emboldened by imagination. They were imagined communities which, uh, if anything, perhaps exaggerated their common identity, common traditions, uh, etc. But it was the self-perception of a common identity, a common fate, a common destiny, which, which drove them. Now, nationalism most often referred then to the pursuit by these nations, these populations feeling this fellowness I just outlined, the pursuit by these nations of historical self-determination, specifically in their own state and hence the term that we hear so often of nation-state. Now, again, it's worth repeating here that in the classic instances of European nationalism, and I, and I mean things like Italian nationalism, I mean things like Irish nationalism, I th mean things like German nationalism, places which for uh, very long periods of time uh, 
had consisted of a quite numerous different, for instance, um, uh, feudal mini-states, if you like. The notion of constructing a state specifically on the basis of the shared or imagined community of nationhood, of fellowness, is largely what drove those classic uh, European nationalist movements with which we are, are so familiar. A nation in search, then, of its political destiny in the form of its own state the nation-state. Now, the definition of nation which I just proffered here, that is common language, traditions, and so on, is extremely close to the one I used early on in this course to refer and attempt to define, to get at the reality of ethnic groups in Africa, or so-called tribe, at least as that term tribe is used in Africa itself. And we used criteria like common language, common traditions, the imagination of felonists, the perception of felonists as part of the ways to construct an identity around ethnicity. Indeed, I often use in my lectures like this one and, and those I, I give normally at my home institution, I often use the term nation as a virtual synonym for ethnic group along with so-called a people, uh, a, a tribe in, in quotation marks usually, but nonetheless. If that's true, then we must make, it seems to me, a, a quite crucial distinction between nationalism as it develops in, in modern history in Europe in the 19th and 20th century in particular, and nationalism as it's usually called as it develops in the middle of the 20th century in Africa. In Africa, as we know, almost every colonial territory included within its borders, not a single, but many nations, as I've just defined that term, usually referred to as ethnic groups or, or tribes. We know that the colonial borders were arbitrary, that they reflected the rivalries between the, the colonizing powers, the participants in the scramble for Africa, and again, in almost every case, they encompassed within those borders numerous nations, as I've been using that term. Now, although there were certainly instances in Africa of single ethnic groups seeking their own independence, and I mean early in the century, classic African nationalists, those who we identify, the great names of African nationalism, which we get much more specific on in the coming lectures, Nkrumah of Ghana, Kenyatta of Kenya, Nyerere of Tanzania, Kaunda of Zambia, Sangor of, of Senegal, and so on. Those classic African nationalists, in a sense, expanded their vision of nation upward from the tribe or the ethnic group to accept the borders of the, the state as created during the imposition of colonial rule, while eventually, as we'll see, they narrowed their vision away from the broader pan-Africanist heyday of the 1920s and 30s. What I'm getting at is that the classic African nationalists generally came to accept the colonial territorial units. They accepted as the boundaries of the field where the game would be played, if you like, the boundaries established during the scramble for Africa. Therefore, whereas European nationalists sought a state for their single nation, African nationalists faced from the start a formidable task of pursuing a state which embodied and included many nations. Or let me put it differently, and perhaps it's an even form more formidable uh, task. They faced the challenge of forging a sense of single nationhood, a greater imagination of, of fellowness amongst populations which were linguistically diverse, culturally diverse, religiously diverse, and so forth. Now, what are the implications of this for the future? It's an axiom, it's, it's a commonplace to observe that common enemies serve as unifiers. While the colonial ruler is there, it easily becomes or can be transformed through the articulations of the nationalists into the common enemy. But the implications of the future 
what happens when the unifying common enemy, the colonial ruler, is gone? Thank you.